Heavenly Father, uh, we are back again. We are at your feet. We're here in this room ready to study. We look forward to what you're going to provide. Uh, Father, we're a, a group of people who, by your power and, and your grace alone, have become part of something much bigger, uh, something eternal. Uh, we were born into this world in the image of a man who sinned, and as such, we were under a condemnation of death. And now, Father, by your grace, we have overcome the world and we have been set free from that condemnation but we have been set free for a purpose and that purpose is in your doing in your will in your economy you have a a goal a, a plan you have knit together epochs of time and millions of uncountable stories of people's lives all of these things father come together in a way that you alone have designed so that we can serve to glorify you and Tonight, what we'll learn, Father, are how, uh, things related to how you have done that, but also, Father, it will remind us that we have a part to play in it, and we want to know what that is as you guide each heart here tonight, Father. Show us in your word how we serve you better. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're entering a new, and I would say a very important section of our study tonight. For those of you who've been with us from the beginning, you know where we've been so far. We've been studying according to an outline that John gets in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, and we've used this outline now to get through a couple, three chapters, and we're going to continue to use it. Uh, the three parts of this book, as you know, are the things that John saw, those things that he experienced past tense in the first chapter, the things that are present tense, the things that continue to be true for the church as long as the church is on earth, and that's what we studied in chapters two and three. And then thirdly, John is to write the things that will follow the things that are, follow the things of the church, that's future tense, and that's chapter 4 and onward. And so far, we have studied, in part 1, what is the authentication of the letter, why we would believe it, why it's valid, that is, knowing it came from Christ. And then in part 2, which we just finished, chapters 2 and 3, we learned how the seven letters to the seven churches represent prophetically a history of the church itself over a period of many, many hundreds, even thousands of years. Each of the periods of the, of the church, seven of them, correspond to the seven letters. And each description in those letters was so brief that it gives us enough to know that we are in a certain period of history or that others have passed already. We can see the details. And yet it was so brief, the, the content was so minimal, that it could not possibly give us enough information to really act upon that is, prophetically speaking. There was nothing in those letters, prophetically, that could have directed the church through hundreds of years of time and given us any direction on what to do. It's only really in hindsight. In fact, you could not even appreciate the prophetic quality of these letters without hindsight, which we learned as we looked through them. So the prophetic value offered by these letters has gone unused, if you will, for the better part of 2,000 years. So why did Jesus give the church that prophetic roadmap if he knew it was not going to be understood nor appreciated in its day, not even for thousands of years? Well, the answer is because these letters were not given to the early church so that they would know their future. It was given so that the church of the last days could awaken to its present circumstances. And, of course, that's you and me today. We are living in the seventh of these seven letters. We are at the end. We just don't know how much longer it goes. Knowing that, though, knowing that we are alive right before the events of chapters 4 and onward is supposed to give us something to think about. It. That the significance of that is supposed to drive our interest in a number of different ways. And so we are the ones living in a very privileged period of history based on what we know in this book. And as a result, we have been called by that knowledge to understand and appreciate the signs of the times and to be ready for what comes next. Now, having said that, in order for us to be ready for that mission, we have to understand not only our present circumstances, but also the history that brought us here. And specifically, we have to understand the, the church, its seven periods, but also where that fits in a larger framework. So you take the church now as a, as a starting point in this journey, the period of time that we have just studied, and you see a beginning in this arc of time. You see an end, as we've noted already. We know we're near the end. We're in the seventh period of seven. 
and it has a certain course in between, fine. Uh, but as you look at that, you come to some very obvious questions. Uh, what comes next? Where does the ark go after? Where does time go after the end of the church age? Uh, and why does it end at all? And in fact, what does it mean that there was a beginning to the church? These are questions we need to answer. The book of Revelation will give us those answers as we move through it. But because the events that lead to the start of the church are important to understanding what comes after the church, before we can go forward, what do you think we're going to do? Yeah, we've got to go backward. So we're going to look at the church age in a larger context. And let me begin by putting the outline of Revelation on top of that so that you can have a bit of an understanding of how to relate the book to this timeline. So the things that John saw are roughly there. And the things that are, well, that's the whole church. And the things that come after these things, well, those are the things that come after the church because the church ends with the seventh letter which is at the end of chapter 3. And we know that chapter 4 begins with after these things, the next part of the book. So we sit with two-thirds of what the book wrote behind us, more or less, and another third, the major third, still to play out. And we still need to back up even further than that. We have to look at a much earlier point in history to understand what's going on. And we're going to start with a couple of terms. Now, if you've studied with me before, even if you've done the seminars I've done on this topic before, some of this will be review, which is not a bad thing, because this is not always something you get the first time. Uh, let's start with a couple of terms that help guide our conversation in the evening to follow. First, let's talk about an age. What is an age? An age, or aeon in Greek, it is a long time, but it is finite. It is not infinite. And it is a period, therefore, in God's program for history that has a beginning and has an end, an age. Ages come one after another, and the division between ages will serve as an important milestone in God's program. The very fact that an age has finished and another age has begun is itself noteworthy. Let me show you how that works in Scripture. One quote from Mark chapter 10, Jesus says this, Truly I say to you that there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake or for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farm, farms, along with persecutions, and, and here's the point, and in the age to come, eternal life. So you, you, know, you don't have eternal life right now you're going to die. But what you have is the promise of eternal life, which is to say the death of your body isn't the end of you, there will be more yet to come. And in the kingdom that follows, the age that follows our current age, you receive that eternal life. So we are in an age now that precedes another age yet to come. Let me just put that in very simple graphic terms for you here. You have a present age, it runs a certain period of time, and then it ends and a new age begins right after that. Time continues on, but God marks these with certain events. Let's go to a new term, last days. You've heard this term, I'm sure, and the Bible uses this term in a couple of ways, but one primarily. A last days, or the, the term last days, refers to the final period of an age, and that final period is signaling to those in that age that they are about to leave that age and move into a new age. Some events, some uh, signs, some things are happening and they tell the, the residents, the, the citizens of that age that they're coming near the end. But as you hear that term, it's tempting, it's, it's natural to think, oh, that's like saying we're, we're right near the end. Well, in a sense, but not exactly. That is to say, sometimes uh, that end period of end times, last days, can go on a long time. It's not like the two-minute warning on a football game necessarily where it's only a fraction of the total time. It can be a majority of the total time. Let me give you an example. In James, he writes this, Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Or Hebrews says this at the outset of his letter, God, after sp uh, he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us, in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. 
Now think about those two letters for a minute. Both are saying that the last days are culminating the end of this age, but James said to the first century church they were already in the last days, and they are storing up their treasure, as it were, in the last days. Kind of a, a silly thing to do, he says. You're, you're almost at the end of this, and you're now trying to collect things in heaven. And the writer of Hebrews goes on to refer to these days as the last days also. You notice that? Well, we know that it's been about 2,000 years since those letters were written, and yet 2,000 years ago, those authors were saying, we're in the last days. Well, if they were in the last days, we're definitely in the last days. We're, we're laster than they are, right? So what makes these days the last days if they're so long? Well, according to Hebrews, you actually get the definition. He says, the last days are when all revelation is complete and there are no more mile markers coming. That's when you know you're in the last days. That in other words, so long as there was still re yet some revelation remaining, something more God needed to do, something more he needed to say before he could bring the age to an end, well, you knew you weren't near the end yet. You knew you were not at the last days of it because there was still more to happen. And particularly, the Messiah was still to appear. This age was not going to end without the Messiah's appearing. But once he had appeared, once the canon of Scripture was complete, which is what the Bible testifies, then you know you're in the last days. There's no more milestones. There's no more pre uh, preceding events. Any, time, any day the, the end could come. We're just waiting for that to happen. So now we're in the last days. And so far it's been 2,000 years of waiting for the last days to end. So our age can conclude without any further warnings, without any further revelation. But even still, it keeps running. Now knowing how ages and last days work in Scripture would naturally bring you to a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, knowing that the, the last days in Scripture uh, can go on for a long time, you might ask, well, where does the church fit in the context of the last days? We have another little graphic for you here. You have the present age, you have the f age to follow, and then the Bible says somewhere near the end of that present age, you enter the last days of that age. Only in this case, we're saying that the church itself is the last days. That is, the writer in the first century said that we were in the last days. That was the first of seven periods. We are in the seventh period. By definition, we're still in the last days. So the whole church age has apparently taken place in the last days of this age. All right, so that leads to new questions. For example, uh, what is this age for? Why did God establish it? Uh, when did it begin? What's it called? What's its purpose? What will cause it to end? I mean, these are the things you should be asking because obviously God went to the trouble to set up a period of time, give it a, a period of, of existence, and tell us about it. Well, that's what we're here to understand tonight. The answers to those questions are in the Bible. They're just not in Revelation. And so while Revelation 4 through 22 tells us what comes after, or more specifically, how this age, our present age, wraps up and what comes after, we want to go back first to understand why this age even exists at all. The first question we need to ask is, what is this age called and why did God establish it? Those two questions are where we start, and the answer comes out of Luke chapter 21. Verse 24, Jesus speaking says, concerning Israel, he says, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jesus refers to a period of history, and he calls it the times of the Gentiles. Now, the word translated there as signs or times, kairos, can also be translated age. So we could translate it this way. We could say the age of the Gentiles are fulfilled. It's the same basic word in Greek. So Jesus just gave us the name of our age. The present age is called the age of the Gentiles. All right? And Gentiles, for anyone who might not know, are all non-Jews. Anyone who's not born physically from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a Gentile. Jesus says we live in an age now that will be defined as an age in which Gentiles have a greater position in the world than Jews will. We will be dominating over Jews. And more specifically, we will dominate Jews in two ways. I'm not saying we personally, I'm saying Gentiles. Gentiles will have an advantage over Jews in two ways during this period of history, as God has appointed. First, he says... Jews will suffer under persecution at the hands of Gentiles. Jews will be killed, 
They'll be persecuted, they'll be scattered, enslaved, sent out of their land. This will be the pattern. This is not to say that every living Jew experiences this, of course. We're saying that as a whole, the people group, the nation of Israel, will be under those circumstances off and on, without relent, during the whole of the age of the Gentiles, at the hands of, Gent at the, uh, hands of Gentile nations. That's what Jesus said. They will fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led captive into all the nations, that is, by the Gentiles, and so on. And the second thing Jesus said was that the city of Jerusalem would be defiled and under Gentile control, trampled, he said, by Gentiles. Trampling would indicate uh, that Gentiles have some authority or control or access to the city in a way that the Jews can't stop. So these are two characteristics of our age. These two things will be true and remain true without changing for the whole of the age of the Gentiles. So if this age, think about this now, if this age that Jesus has named now is marked by these qualities, Jewish persecution, trampling of, uh, of Jerusalem, etc., then we, le we leave now with several considerations out of that fact. Obviously, our age, which includes the time of the church, uh, had a beginning. And if there was a beginning, then that means there was a moment in history in the past, somewhere in the past, where these two things started to happen where before that moment, they weren't true. But after that moment, they became true, and that's what started our present age. And so, we need to identify some point in history when Jewish people started to encounter this kind of systematic persecution at the hands of Gentiles and lost control of their capital city, of Jerusalem. That's where Jesus said this age begins. Now, there is one book of Scripture that gives us the history on that point, and I'm sure for the most part many of you know this because it's something we're taught very early in our walk through prophecy. One book in the Old Testament, in a sense it's really a prologue to the book of Revelation. Uh, it's literally impossible to understand the book of Revelation if you don't understand this Old Testament book. Uh, it's been called the Old Testament book of Revelation and the first part of the book of Revelation, and it's all because it's intended to be a companion. It's the book of Daniel. So the book of Daniel exists to give us the backstory that leads us into the book of Revelation. Now, studying the entire book is very helpful. You, my wife is currently teaching the women through it. We have a study online if you're interested. Uh, but we don't have to do the whole book here. There are a handful of chapters that are key, and we'll do those chapters here as we need to throughout the course of this study. And for our sake tonight, particularly chapters 2 and 7, we'll do 2 tonight, we'll look a little bit at 7 next week, and then move out of it into other things. Uh, not next week, sorry, I won't be here next week, but moving out of that into later things, okay? We'll talk about the schedule later. All right, so Jesus gave this age its name. We learn the details of how this age ends in the book of Revelation, but Daniel tells us how it begins. And more than how it begins, he also tells, it all that it, uh, tells us all that it will contain. And we're going to refer back to what we're going to learn tonight over and over again throughout the course of this study all the way to the very end. That's how important tonight is. So we're going to move through the first part of this chapter relatively quickly, and we'll focus more on the end. Let's go uh, to Daniel chapter 4, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. And what we're doing is we're taking the church period of time, and we're going to put it into a perspective that looks far back in history at why that age even got started. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor, and therefore declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the dream to his servants and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you're bargaining for time inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you, for you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. And therefore, tell me the dream, that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth 
who could declare the matter for the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. All right, here's the backstory, and again, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. I just want you to understand the context. Uh, the nation of Babylon invaded the nation of Israel, of so the southern kingdom of Judah, and captured the city of Jerusalem around 600 B.C., give or take. That was the first time in history that the city of Jerusalem had fallen to a foreign invader since King David had established Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And Babylon eventually went on to attack three times in total. Each time they did more damage, each time they took more of the city captive. What Nebuchadnezzar succeeded in doing, which others had failed to do, it happened because the Lord granted him permission to do it when he had never done that for anyone before. And that means that his invasion, his destruction of the city was part of a larger plan that God was at work doing through him. But here's the interesting part. He didn't know that. He was unaware that his own political ambition was part of God's doing. That he was essentially a puppet, as, as all humanity is, in God's hands as he moves uh, nations on earth and creates outcomes according to his will. But he didn't want the king to be ignorant of that, so there comes a point at which the Lord uses a young man named Daniel, who was among the contingent of Jews that were taken captive and removed from Jerusalem and brought back to Babylon. Daniel is used by God to inform the king about why all of this is happening. And the first chapter of Daniel's book records Daniel's flight into Babylon, how he became a servant, a, a, a member of the court of the king in Babylon, and how he learned what he did. And then we get to the point where the, the Lord is going to raise Daniel up, bring him into the court, and give Daniel an opportunity. And that's what you see happening here. There is this dream that God gives Nebuchadnezzar that's so intense that the, the king has to find an answer for it. And in verse 1, we hear that it's his second full year as king. And as such, he is early in his reign. He has this dream. And at that point, he can't understand it. He goes to all his magicians. He says, as you read, uh, you're going to have to tell me what this dream is before you tell me what the interpretation is because I don't trust you guys. Uh, you've, you've put one over on me before and this is too important. So they protest, as you see. He says, uh -huh, I know what you're up to. No, I'm not going to relent. You're going to have to tell me both. We go back and forth for a while and he's right at the point where he uh, tells these men, okay, I'm going to just dispense with all of you because you're obviously a bunch of uh, frauds. And that's what you see in verse 12. He says, because of this, the king became indignant and, and very furious, gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And so the decree went forth that wise men should be slain. And they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's commander, for what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles. Sorry, I went back one too far. My fault, guys. There we go. Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the, the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise man, conjurer, magician, nor diviner are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me other than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king, that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. All right, so Daniel gets to the point of understanding that he's going to die because the king's upset at all conjurers, magicians, and the sort, and the like. And Daniel was a part of that crowd because uh, Nebuchadnezzar had enlisted him into that work. And in some way, Daniel felt led by the Spirit to know that he had an answer. So he raises his hand and says, before you kill me, can I take a shot? And he goes before the king, and the king says, so you think you can do this? This is my paraphrasing. 
And Daniel says, well, I can't do this. Well, there's a God in heaven who can do this. And this God in heaven is directing me to show you what your dream means. Now, in all that I just read, there's a couple of key details that we read to find. The first of these is that Daniel tells the king, before he starts to give him the interpretation, he gives the king an overview, and he says, what you have seen in your dream concerns events of the future. That is, of the future from 605 B.C., from that day that they were talking, roughly 600 B.C. And he says, it also deals specifically with the latter days, or we could use the phrase we learned either uh, earlier, last days. Last days. So this dream, to put it simply, tells the story of our present age all the way up through the last days of it. So this is the roadmap. This is God giving a preview of coming attractions through Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel of what the age we're currently a part of will look like. He gave it all the way back in this part of history, and it comes in four parts. The first part follows. A little bit more reading. Verse 31. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue, and that statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, then the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of, earth, of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. All right, so first let's note the obvious. Uh, we're looking at a statue here. So there's a statue in this dream. The centerpiece is a statue. It has divisions, and these divisions are quite strange. The parts are like different parts of different statues stuck together. And, you know, the, the drawings that you can find, like the one I found, are simply a best guess at what the dream must have looked like, of course. But we have a pretty good description here. You'll notice the materials in the statue change from gold on top, silver, brass, down to iron and pottery. So they're decreasing in value even as they increase in strength or brittleness. Uh, Daniel describes the divisions uh, as he goes from head to toe, he starts at the top and he moves down. And he describes at the very end of all of this what comes to destroy this statue. He says, a stone uncut by human hands descends from above like an asteroid, I guess, and strikes the statue at the feet. And as a result of hitting it at the feet, it manages to destroy the whole of it. It turns into chaff, dust, and then it's blown away. There's not a trace of it left when it's all said and done. All that remained is the stone, and then that stone grows to become a mountain, he says, and it fills the whole earth. All right, that's the dream. Now, despite its simplicity, no one in the world could imagine what that means. You, without a, an interpretation from God, you could speculate, certainly, and we'd all have a different speculation, but that's not the same thing as truth. And as a result, we'd have no real clear indication of what this statue represented. It could mean almost anything. So the Lord works through Daniel now to explain it. So he gives, uh, Dan he gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream that is so inscrutable and yet so powerful that Nebuchadnezzar is lost without help and desperately wants that help. And as such, he's created the perfect environment in which he can raise up Daniel to meet that need. By the way, there's a, there's a good week of preaching in that situation because that's what the Lord does all the time. He raises up needs so that we plug them with, the, with whatever he's equipped us to do. So it's, it's designed by God to bring people together and do ministry through that connection. Here's an obvious moment of when that happens. So Daniel has the decoder ring to make sense of the puzzle that God has given to Nebuchadnezzar. So let's turn to the interpretation and he first gives the meaning of the statue starting at the top in the same order that he describes it. He says the head of gold at the top of the statue, represents Nebuchadnezzar as the ruler of Babylon. And he tells the king something very interesting, something that will come to be very interesting and important for us 
many months from now. So we'll remind you of it when we get there. Don't worry. And this is what he says. He says that this king will have the power to conquer the entire earth. Not just what he knows of the earth, but all of it. He says everywhere that a bird flies, everywhere that an animal exists on earth, it is under Nebuchadnezzar's authority. Uh, Jeremiah confirms this, by the way. Jeremiah was a contemporary of Daniel, and he wrote uh, some similar things. And in, Dan in Jeremiah 27, he wrote this, 27.5. I have made the earth, the Lord speaking here, I have made the earth, the men, and the beasts, which are on the face of the earth, by my great power and by my outstretched hand, and I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Now, I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the wild animals of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings will make him their servant. So we know that Nebuchadnezzar did not travel to every inch of the globe. But here's what we just learned. Had he done so, he would have conquered every living thing on earth because God has pre had prepared it for him. God has decreed that it would be so. Isn't that interesting? You don't have to exercise the authority God gives you to have it. And in this case, he had the, exercise, he had the authority, that, though he couldn't exercise it to the extent that uh, you know, would have proven it, but it was there. So he has assigned this immense amount of power, one man government, one man rule of the whole planet for a period of time. But at the same time, we also heard through Jeremiah, for example, that this rule was not going to last forever. That is to say that God was going to take Nebuchadnezzar's place away at some point and others were going to make him their servant. And as a result, we come to understand that in this statue, though it starts with a representation of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, certainly, and Babylon was a very powerful world leader in its, or a very powerful uh, empire in its day, it stretched uh, virtually from Europe, present day Greece, all the way into India, northern Africa. Uh, it's quite an expanse to cover in that day, and it ruled to that extent. But in biblical terms, he had rule of the whole planet. But then it was going to come to an end. And so we see from Jeremiah that it wasn't a permanent position of authority. And we see from Daniel, coming back now to the text of Daniel, that he wasn't the last empire of the earth either because there's still a lot of statue left. Daniel says in chapter 2, verse 39, after you, I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar was loving the prophecy until we got to that <laughs> verse. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you and then another third kingdom of bronze which will rule over all the earth. So Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, you're the beginning, but you're not the end. There will be another kingdom, and it will replace you, and then a third kingdom will come along and replace the second one. We're in a, a, a series or a, a sequence of ruling here. So before we look at who the thir second and third are, you need to understand what you just learned about the statue in and of itself. You just learned that the head of gold stood for one kingdom, and now as we move to a new material, we move to a new kingdom. So each material means a new kingdom. And as such, when you move down from top to bottom on this statue, what you're realizing is this is a timeline. The statue itself represents the passage of time. From a certain moment when Nebuchadnezzar became king to some future moment that we haven't defined yet. So it's a creative way of representing the passage of time. And that passage of time is called the age of the Gentiles. You're looking at the start of the age of the Gentiles. How do we know that this is the beginning of the age of the Gentiles? Well, remember what the definition of the age of the Gentiles is. The people of Israel scattered outside their land, persecuted, enslaved, killed, and the nation of Israel's capital city, trampled by Gentiles. The very first time those two things were true in history was when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. Before that, never had happened. Since that has happened, it's never not been this way. It's never been the case that Israel has fully regained a completely peaceful and exclusive control of their capital city. 
Never has it been the case that Israel has ceased to be persecuted, enslaved, killed, and so on. There have been certainly good periods of history relative to others. There have been bad periods of history relative, but the pattern has not fundamentally changed. So before that moment, when Solomon was king, Israel was the world superpower. They were the most powerful nation in their area of the world. No one challenged Solomon. And in a period of time from then until 605 BC, we move from that state of affairs to Israel entering in the age of the Gentiles. So now we're here to understand how this age proceeds, knowing now that it has started and how it started. Now we're going to look at more of how it proceeds through time. Daniel says the second kingdom will defeat Babylon and yet be inferior to Babylon. The inferiority of the second kingdom is represented by the fact that silver is of lesser value than gold. And we understand why silver is considered less valuable. It's the way we uh, assign value to precious metal. But what does it say about the second kingdom that it's representing? How is the kingdom less valuable than Babylon, so to speak, and yet still able to conquer Babylon? Well, to understand that question, you have to understand what kingdom replaced Babylon in history. Ba Daniel doesn't give us that. At the time that Daniel wrote this, it was still future even for Daniel. And as we look at possibilities, like what nations might we suggest as options for the next in line? Well, it's not hard to find them, but even if we were to stop before we look, there is a set of rules we can follow that ensure we don't pick the wrong ones. And the rules come out of the age of the Gentiles definition. What are the rules? Well, here are the criteria for whether or not you can be one of the precious metals in the statue. First of all, you gotta be a Gentile kingdom. So it's never going to be Israel. Israel's never one of the pieces of the statue by, for obvious reasons. It's, they're not going to persecute themselves. It's a Gentile persecution period, okay? Secondly, they have to be the dominant power in their day. If you can name a power and I can name a more dominant one, you haven't got the right one. So they've got to be the most dominant power of their day. Thirdly, they have to defeat their predecessor. That's a pretty clear sign. They have to be the one that replaces the one before. And if you're going to fulfill the purpose of the age of the Gentiles, you have to trample Jerusalem, which in my way of saying it is you have to control Jerusalem. You have to invade Jerusalem. And here's a bit of a corollary. If you're going to defeat the predecessor, and the predecessor in this case is Babylon, what land must you also have in order to complete this four-part requirement? What, if, if you're going to have to defeat Babylon, what must you have control of? Babylon. So, in other words, you not only have occupation of Jerusalem, you have to occupy Babylon. Because if you want to conquer the United States, you've got to take Washington, D.C., right? That's the idea. So, we look for a nation that was able to take, a Gentile nation that was able to take Jerusalem and Babylon in displacing the nation of Babylon. And there's only one, of course, that meets that definition. And that's the Medo-Persian Empire. So, the Medo-Persian Empire came along uh, in 550 B.C., and that kingdom was formed out of an alliance of the Medes and the Persians, which is why they call it the Medo-Persian Empire. And that's why in the statue, their part of the statue is represented by the two arms. Now, most people who draw the statue have drawn it with arms crossed. But it's interesting, that's not actually in the text. Well, the arms could be like this, I guess, but uh, I don't mind that they're crossed. I think that's probably appropriate, but the point is just that it's not in the dream. Nonetheless, those two arms represent the Medes and the Persians working together in one kingdom. All right, This kingdom had the power to challenge Babylon in sheer numbers. They were known for overwhelming armies. They, they would mass millions of men. And even if Babylon had better armament or was more sophisticated in the way that they conducted battle, there's a certain point at which numbers just win. And that was the way that the Medo-Persians did their, their work. So they were less majestic in that respect, and yet still able to conquer. Um, and to understand how they were less majestic beyond simply that, you have to also understand how they governed. Uh, in the case of the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, we've already been told, had complete control over the whole planet, even though he didn't exercise it. But that was never given to Cyrus or Darius or any of the other leaders of the Medo-Persian Empire. So... There's no indication that that level of authority was passing down. God started, one, started the first with it, but he never gave it to anyone after that. 
And yet those other nations did conquer. So they conquered, but they did it less majestically. They had less authority. And even in the way they ruled their own people, they had less uh, dominance. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was an uh, absolute despot. He could do whatever he wanted. There were no rules. But in the Medo-Persian way of ruling, kings had power, yes, but they were required to uh, obey or to keep prior precedent, to not change prior kings' rulings, kind of like the way courts work today. That was a, a kind of a check on their power. So that diminished them to some extent. All right? So we find them to be a lesser kingdom, and yet they managed to conquer. So we now have the Medo-Persians. Third, verse 20, uh, 39, rather, verse 39, Daniel goes on to say, a third kingdom will assume power over the world. And you notice how quickly he goes through two and three. There'll be a second. Oh, yeah, there'll be a third. The third is also easy to find because it meets this. There's only one more kingdom now that could meet the definitions we gave a moment ago. And as you probably know, it's the Medo Persian, I mean, it's the uh, Hellenistic Empire of Alexander the Great in 330 BC. He rolled from the west into the east like lightning and he overtook the kingdom that Medo-Persians had, and he's represented by bronze in this statue, and the bronze uh, belly down into the thigh region of the, of the statue. Uh, he competed with leaders of city-states to rule. He didn't have the same kind of autocratic rule that the prior two kingdoms had. He worked more with local rulers. His real leverage was his army, so he didn't have pure political power but he had a military that meant basically he got what he wanted as long as he was alive. Uh, notice in this section of the statue, you go from a single piece of the body to two now as you reach into the, the thighs. There's a split taking place here, and that's part of how the kingdom changes too because after Alexander the Great died unexpectedly very young, he had no heirs, and so they divided up that large region I showed you earlier on the map into fours, four sections, but primarily they divided it east and west. And the generals of his army inherited those four regions. The two generals that were in the west aligned with each other. And the two generals in the east did the same against the other two. And so you ended up with two against two in their political uh, division. And that's represented by the dividing of the statue into an east and west, so to speak, with the legs. And the concept of the western world and the Eastern world originated at that point in history, and it has continued ever since. The historical effect today of, of talking about West versus East, you just take that for granted. That was not the way the world spoke until the Hellenistic division. But ever since then, it's never gone away. And as you look at the statue, in this age, the legs never come back together again. So it's a reflection of how history has played out. There was a division that has never rejoined. All right, Daniel's interpretation raced through those two because, frankly, they don't matter. They only matter because they connect the first to the last. They give you confidence to know that you're interpreting it correctly, but they're not the point. The point of this, as you might imagine, is at the ends. You want to know when the age starts, and you're really interested to know how it ends because you're part of it, and that's where this is going. The last is the most interesting and the most important. Uh, the fourth kingdom. Now next week when we come back into this, we'll look at another chapter of Daniel, but we're only going to look at the fourth kingdom in that chapter because this is the point. The fourth kingdom gets the most treatment in this chapter for good reason. Look at the next section here. I'll just mark here where we just what we learned, that the Greek empire now represents down to the end of the, the brass area, the bronze area. And now in chapter 2, verse 40. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong, some will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. The final kingdom that we're now studying here, the fourth one, features these interesting materials m combining together, the least valuable by far, and this very strange combination of strength and brittleness, strength and, and lack thereof. And if you notice also, it has a tendency to break apart. 
and then be recombined again because pottery, if it's made wet, it can be you know, refashioned. So this kingdom replaces the ones that came before it, but it does so in a very unique way. And this is where you have to pay a lot of attention to the details or you start to miss the change. You start to apply the pattern that you've witnessed in the first three. You, you, you just, without thinking, you apply it to the fourth one, but you can't because he just said the fourth one's different. The fourth one doesn't operate by the same rules that the first three did. It only operates the same in the sense that it's part of the same statue. But it does its own thing. Rather than holding territory together as the previous kingdoms have done, under a single government, a single ruler, a single name, that's changed. That's not the case anymore. He says, this one breaks apart and then recombines and then crushes and breaks apart and then comes back together. And sometimes it's strong and some parts aren't. It's a mess. But collectively, these pieces work together to continue the fulfillment of the age of the Gentiles. Collectively, and when I say collectively, I don't mean that they do it necessarily with any organization. I'm not saying that they're any more consciously working on it than Nebuchadnezzar was conscious of his role to ru rule the whole world. I'm saying that God uses them to accomplish that outcome, though they themselves aren't necessarily privy to it. The effect of this, though, is you have a kingdom whose various pieces combine and decompose and combine and decompose over time, yet consistently what they do is they prevent the rise of Israel. Consistently they hold Israel under the penalties that God has imposed through the age of the Gentiles. It continues to exist until such time as the statue itself no longer is in existence. And what kind of earthly kingdom would fit this unique set of details? Where do we begin? Well, we know where the fourth kingdom starts simply because we know where the Alexander, uh, the Hellenistic Empire ended. So history gives us that answer. We know it was the Roman Empire that came along and displaced the Hellenistic Empire, empire in about 168 BC. Rome eventually defeats Judea, present day Jerusalem, uh, Israel, uh, in 63 BC. So in, technically, if you're looking at the terms that we've established for the age of the Gentiles, when did Rome finally become the displacing power in 63 BC? By that point, they had already conquered Babylon, and now they had taken Jerusalem. So in all four cases, these kingdoms had the same met the same criteria. At, at, they had all held the land of Jerusalem. They all held the land of the previous uh, kingdom, which included Babylon. And they were Gentile nations trampling over Israel. Rome did that in 63 BC, and it continued to expand for centuries after that. And then it started to change. And as Rome began to conquer and expand and then weaken and then be infiltrated by other nations seeking to reclaim that land, it began to go through a very dramatic series of transformations over hundreds of years. We talk about the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire, and people cannot accurately date the end of the Roman Empire. If you've wondered why there is no such date, it's because it did not end, not in the traditional sense. It added territory by assimilating cultures and lands. It changed the culture in some cases. Uh, it, it was iron in the sense that the Romans were completely intolerant of any kind of, of resistance or uh, 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 any insurrection, any kind of uh, fight against their power. They were ruthless in that regard. You know the story of Masada? You got, you know, hundred and something people sitting on the top of a rock. Who cares, right? No, the Romans, they cared. They built a ramp the size of, of a 25-story building to get up there just because they wanted to make sure no one could tell them that they couldn't do it that no one was going to stand in their way. That's who Romans were. All right. So as, the, as that empire expanded and then began to change, what took its place? Where are we now in the fourth kingdom, so to speak? Well, exactly what Daniel said happened. Exactly. It started to fracture. It started to break into pieces. And you get to something over a period of centuries called the Holy Roman Empire, which is the basis of modern Europe. And yes, the name Rome went away, Romans went away. Rome became just a city within a single nation at a point in time. But that's where you're, you need to divorce yourself from terminology and look at what Daniel actually said. Daniel said that you should expect this, this entity 
to be like different pieces matched together that really don't match. And because of that, they keep breaking up. You know, they have a European Union, and then they have a Brexit. And then they have the, you know, Ottoman Empire, and then they get rid of that, and then they have the, you know, some Germanic Empire, and then some Austrian Empire, and then Nazism comes along, and that goes away, and then it's the exact thing that Daniel said would happen in Europe. And the same thing's been happening, by the way, in the Middle East and parts of Africa. There is no stability to the national borders of these places. There is, you know, you have the, the Bosnian conflict, you had the Balkan Wars at times, you've had you know, the Cold War, you've had nations become part of the Eastern Bloc and then fall out of the Eastern Bloc. I mean, it's, you couldn't have writ it, written it better than in the few verses that Daniel provided for us in chapter 2. It's exactly what has been happening. What is the collective effect, though, of all of that happening? You still have Israel outside the land. Britain was over it for a while. The Ottomans were over it for a while. Others have come and gone. And Israel has now recently been able to establish a presence there again, which we'll come back to later in this study. But my point is that the effect of all of that is to continually provide for the age of the Gentiles and what it requires. It just doesn't come under the banner of one national name. But Daniel told you not to look for that. He told you to look for something different. So what we have now, is, and by the way, the Holy Roman Empire, if people don't realize this, the Holy Roman Empire didn't cease to exist until the 19th century until something else came along. I mean, that just shows you how uh, effective that, that institution has been at holding itself together in one form or another. So here we have a problem now. We have this statue with the fourth kingdom, but we gotta, we gotta call it something. What are you gonna call it? People sometimes call it the Roman Empire. The problem with that is that's just where it began. That's not where it is. Some have tried to find some other entity like the Catholic Church or something else to pin it on. Here again, what they're looking for is what they can't have. They're looking for a single entity that they can sum up the kingdom with, but Daniel has told us you can't do that. It's at the very end going to be a divided kingdom of ten. And even now it's not one, it's two. It's two legs. There's no such thing as one name here. So we have to come up with something that's a little more general. And the, one, the name I would propose to you, the one I like to use, is this is a period of history in which imperialistic democratic alliances. <laughs> you don't like it? Come up with a better one. I'll take it. But it's a period in which you have imperialism is when one nation goes out and establishes another vassal, another part of the world as its own possession, but then leaves the culture intact, leaves the people there, just rules them from a distance. That's imperialism. And it's democratic in that you see these nations coming together and leaving and coming together and leaving. Why? Because the people keep changing their minds on what they want to do. Or they keep shifting their alliances one to another. You get that kind of breaking apart and recombining because you do not have absolute power, because you do not have monarchs who can make decisions without challenge. Because it's imperialistic and democratic, it keeps changing. But behind the scenes, you have an all-knowing, all-powerful God sovereignly deciding that this entity will serve his purpose in retaining or continuing the age of the Gentiles. That's how you have to understand this. All right. Now, let's understand how this age comes to an end. Daniel says in verse 44, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put to an end all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of a mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So this dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. All right, here's the final piece from Daniel tonight. He says that that ending scene that the king saw, that scene in which the, the rock comes out of the heavens and crushes the statue at the feet, he said that's actually representative of a new kingdom coming, another kingdom. Notice he says this kingdom is set up by God not by man. Notice also he says this kingdom will not be left for another people to take over. This kingdom will endure forever. And then finally you notice he also says that this kingdom uh, will crush and put to an end all these kingdoms. Now that's kind of interesting when you think about it because of all of those kingdoms we've studied so far, how many of them will be around at the point when this must happen? How many are still around now? How many are around at any given time? At any given time, there was only one of them. That's the nature of a timeline. 
It's moving in time. So pick a point on the timeline. You're only going to be pointing at one, wherever you are. So he says this rock will destroy all of them. How can you interpret that? How do we understand that then? It must mean that he's saying it will put an end to the age of the Gentiles. The statue in its totality doesn't represent one kingdom. It represents this whole age of kingdoms. And so to say that this coming kingdom will destroy the whole statue is a way of saying it puts an end to the age. It doesn't just stick on the bottom of it and become yet another piece of it. It puts an end to it. So that's the phrase that clues us in to know this event, this rock, whatever it is, is the event that actually ends the age and allows the next age to begin. All right, so this is, what's, we're, this is what we're learning, how our age ends. And it ends here because, he says, you have this rock coming down from heaven. Now, we know this stone cannot be another Gentile nation. How do I know that? Well, we just said it ends the age of the Gentiles. It ends the age that is defined as a period of Gentiles having prominence. So if the time in which Gentiles have prominence is going to end, what is a non-Gentile? It has, there's only one answer to that. It's a Jew. So this has to be a Jewish kingdom. If it were any other Gentile empire, under any other terms, any other conditions, then you would still be in the age of Gentiles. So if he says this one puts an end to the statue, he's saying this one puts an end to the age. If he's putting an end to the age of the Gentiles, he's putting an an end to Gentiles ruling over Israel. He must be setting up a Jewish kingdom. And that means he's also putting an end to things like the trampling over of the city and the persecution of Gentiles and the enslavement of Gentiles. And that means he's putting an end to their being scattered outside the land. Those are all features of the age of the Gentiles. If they're all coming to an end, their opposites are all coming true. And this kingdom, he says, will be set up by God himself. Daniel says it's represented by an uncut stone. Now, uncut means not worked by human hands, not fashioned by a stone cutter. Where in the Bible do you hear that being mentioned? Why is that important? You might be thinking of something in the law. In Deuteronomy, when God tells the nation of Israel how to build their stone altars, he makes it very clear that those altars cannot use stones that have been worked by human hands. They must be uncut, natural. Now the reason for that, out of Deuteronomy, he, let me read it for you. He says in Deuteronomy 27, 5, you shall build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not wield an iron tool on them. You shall build the altar of the Lord your God of uncut stones, and you shall offer it burnt, on it burnt offerings to the Lord your God. Here's why he's using uncut stone. What's an altar? What's it for? Place of sacrifice. It's the place you take an animal and you sacrifice it. All right? As an aside, this is why churches do not have altars, and nor should we ever refer to anything that's in our churches as an altar, because what you're saying is that's a place of sacrifice. And Jesus has made the once and forever sacrifice for us. There is no more need for sacrifice. So we don't want an altar because we don't need it. Right? If you have a flat thing on your stage, what do you call it? The table. <laughs> Just don't call it an altar. <laughs> Sorry, pet peeve of mine. Uh, so what is an altar? It's a place of sacrifice. So God is talking about a place of sacrifice. What are sacrifices for? Why does God institute them? What is their purpose? They are a a means of atoning. Blood is the atonement, right? So one life given to cover the the sin or the the debt of another. And so a sacrifice is for atonement. So when God told the nation of Israel, you're going to practice ritual atonement. You're going to practice ritual sacrifice, and it's going to teach you about atonement. It's going to teach you about sacrifice and so on. But I don't want you doing it on altars you built for yourself because that sends the wrong message. It says you participate in your own atonement. It says you contribute to your own salvation. I worked the stone, I added my work to the process of making a sacrifice, and so it communicates bad theology. It says you have a part to play in your own atonement. We don't. We take stones God-fashioned, i.e. natural stones, and we just throw them on a pile like you see in that picture, and yeah, it's not flat and it doesn't look pretty to us, but that's the point. As soon as you try to start making what God does pretty, you ruin it. So it's what God alone does that is the point, and so our stones are to be uncut. That's in the way the law required Israel to, 
to do what he asked them to do. But in the fact that he's using that term now, what he's suggesting is that this stone is not something prepared by men, not something humans have done. This is something God alone has done. And that uncut stone becomes then something very important. It begins to symbolize something. If you add it all up, for example, you have a Jewish kingdom. You have a Jewish kingdom that rules the whole earth. A Jewish kingdom ruling the whole earth above all Gentile nations. One that comes at the end of this age and starts the next age. And it begins by a uncut stone, or let's call it the rock, that comes from heaven. I mean, is it not obvious what we're talking about, right? So that rock comes, and it hits at what point on the statue? Yeah, why is it important that it's hitting at the feet? The feet represent the end of the age. So in timeline, in, in terms of the timeline, when does the rock come? At the end of the age. So the rock is Jesus, if you hadn't already figured that out. He is the one who returns. This is his second coming. Daniel is prophesying on the, the Lord's second coming. What's interesting, of course, is that at that point in history, they didn't know there would be a second coming. He was prophesying, now we know, the second coming of Christ. Because the current age was the age when he was here for the first coming. He's the one who said, we are in the age of the Gentiles. He was alive. He had already come at that point. So if he was alive and he's saying it's the age of the Gentiles, then by definition, his first coming did not put an end to it. It was still happening. So it's his second coming that puts an end to it. And that's what we're waiting for. All right? So as we stand here in history, the coming of that rock is the next milestone in God's prophetic plan. Notice the statue. How much of the statue has already come to pass? Effectively, all of it, but for the toes. But for the toes. So when the toes appear, the rock can appear. But we know that. That is to say, there's no more revelation necessary. All that we need to know has been given. We're just waiting for it to finish. Therefore, we are in the last days. Nothing more that we need to know in order for this to, to come to pass. Okay? So, let's just sum it up. The rock, not hard. The toes, what does it rep not, not specifically what it represents, but in, in the sense of the statue overall, what does it represent? Right, the end of the age. And lastly, that mountain that grows out of the coming of the rock. Mountains in Scripture have a certain symbolic meaning, and we've talked about this in the past here. How do you find the symbol's meaning? You go back and you look at how it's used in Scripture. It was given in the actual context here. What was the context? It's a kingdom. He says in that verse, a kingdom will come, God will set up a kingdom. And that's the interpretation of what was the image. The image from earlier in the chapter was, you saw a rock, it came and it grew into a mountain that filled the whole earth. Now we have the interpretation. That was a kingdom filling the whole earth. So there's your confirmation that mountain is kingdom. Okay, so here's, here's where we are. We know that the church is a part of the last days of an age. The age is now called the age of the Gentiles. We sit at the last days of it, and we're not just in the last days. You know, James and the writer of Hebrews, we're in the last days. We're in the last of the last days. We're in the seventh of the seven. We're at the last two-minute warning of the two-minute warning of the last period. It could still go on for a while, but we're at the end. Now, with that, we're going to come back next week, and we're going to look uh, I keep saying next week. Let me just keep correcting that. I'm not here next week. So uh, let's talk schedule for just a moment. Uh, we can do this for the benefit of everyone. We're going to be gone from this room for the next two weeks. Not next week. I'm, I'm not here next week, and I'm not here the week after that. I'm traveling overseas. Uh, because of that, we don't meet because we don't have somebody else come up and try to do this for you. You I come back. So... Uh, we will not have the Revelation class here for the next two weeks. Mark your calendars for when I come back, okay? So uh, if you ever want to know, you can always go to the website and, and look at the events section, see when the next teaching is scheduled. That's how you'll know. Uh, so mark it on your calendar, come back. And then when we do, we'll be looking at Daniel 7 just briefly because there's some more detail to the fourth kingdom we need. And then we get into chapter 4 and start moving into the things that happen after these things, okay? Looking at what comes after the church age. All right, let's end there. As always, we'll have a little question at the end. You guys can stick around if you'd like. Let's go to prayer. Thank you, Father, again for giving us this information. We, we marvel at the power you have to move nations and people to uh, 
put us into this plan in even just the smallest way, Father, is amazing. We thank you, Father, for that blessing. I ask, Lord, that each person here would be moved by what they learn, moved to serve you better in the days that remain, moved to share the news of the gospel with more that might need to hear it, Father, just to be more open and ready to do what you call so that when the day comes that you come for us, Father, we're ready for you. And I pray this in Jesus' name.